for me personally, great revelations that I've had in thinking about this stuff, and it sounds so naive, but I really did used to think that humans in the 21st century lived outside of nature. And the more I know about climate change, it's very clear. We are entirely dependent on the system. It encloses us, it provides the air we breathe, it provides the food we, I mean, that sounds so kindergarten level, but um, I do think that the way that most of us live our lives is on the presumption that we are protected from um, a mass extinction. Mm -hmm. um, the mass extinction that we're living through, and we're not. <laughs> um, I will say that the first time you came on my radar, and probably many folks in this room, was after the uh, the article in 2017. Um, very briefly, uh, what made you think the world needed another uh, depressing, long-form article about climate change? Well, I guess the short answer is that I didn't feel that there had been all that many of them, certainly not um, enough to clearly state the scale and speed and severity of the crisis. Um, you know, I, I'm somebody who came to this issue quite, I mean, I'm 37, but quite late in my relatively short life. I had lived um, my whole adult life, my whole childhood in New York City, feeling that that was a place that protected me against the forces of nature. And while I understood in theory that climate change was a problem, I also thought that it was something that was happening elsewhere. And um, that ultimately it was a challenge for sort of ecosystems, other species, um, it was a challenge for our politics, but not an existential one. And I had that impression, I think, because that was the main tone of most um, climate journalism that I consumed. And I was consuming that as a kind of engaged reader of the news without a special interest in climate, but reading the New York Times, reading the Washington Post, watching the television news, I heard about climate change mostly as a manageable, compartmentalizable, threat and was often presented with sort of parables of, you know, dying polar bears and Arctic ice melt. And as someone who, you know, was frankly a sort of a human chauvinist who cared primarily about the fate of humans, I wanted us to stabilize the planet's climate, but I also didn't understand just how threatened um, my life and the lives of everyone that I knew how threatened we all were by this, by this change. Um, that is something I had started to sort of see in new research that I was reading in 2016. Um, you know, as a magazine journalist, I just have a sort of a special interest in the near future, and so I'm always looking at stuff that's coming out of the academy. I was seeing a lot more about climate, and then what I was seeing was much more concerning than the sort of baseline understanding I had been given, or felt I had been given. And even more than the sort of um, bad news, it felt to me um, in a sort of profound way an untold epic story. I mean, I did respond to it as a storyteller as much as, as a human, as a humanitarian, um, as a political actor, in the sense that um, when I started putting together all of these new bits of research, um, which added up to a really total portrait of a global threat um, defining the whole theater of human existence as you know, one shaped by climate crisis, um, I started to see that saga in quite dramatic, epic terms, that this was the greatest story of all time, that it put a special burden on each of us as not just observers and witnesses to the story, but as protagonists. And um, I didn't feel that any of the climate storytelling that I was reading was quite up to the task of that saga. Um, it was always very measured, very earnest, very careful. And when I started to sort of take in what I understood to be the full scale of the crisis, I thought it was much more cinematic, much more grand, and much more demanding than most climate storytelling had been. 
Um, now, I think that's actually changed a fair amount over the last couple of years. I think that there is much more urgency in the storytelling that we're doing about climate. But a couple of years ago, I felt very much out on my own. Um, you know, I, I could connect to people who had particular views of just how bad things could get. Spoke to a lot of scientists who felt the same way, even if they were uncomfortable saying so in public. But still, I think really up until last October, I would say, when the UN published this big report um, on the difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and two degrees of warming, I think basically the public had not yet woken up to um, just how fast things were going bad, um, just how all-encompassing that, that the threat would be, and just how bad it would get if we didn't change course quite dramatically. As I say, that's beginning to change, um, but I still think we, as a, as a species, as, a, as you know, the United States, Canada, countries like ours, cultures like ours, um, have not yet really reckoned with just how dramatic this crisis is, just how um, significantly it demands us, it demands we act, how immediately it demands we act. Um, even, all, we were talking about this a little bit backstage, but even those of us who count ourselves woke on climate, engaged on climate, live most of our lives in denial and delusion about just how totally transformed our lives will be too in the decades ahead. And I think we need to change that if we have any hope of addressing this crisis at the scale that it demands. Well, clearly you, you tapped into something and uh, you know, the, the article rocketed around the world. Was there a moment when you realized, oh shit, I'm the climate guy now. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is my beat. Well, on some level, I still don't entirely feel that way. Um, I still think of myself as a general interest journalist who has some sort of broad, sociological, reflective impulses. Um, and there's part of me that thinks, you know, okay, I've like tackled this, now move on. On the other hand, I know also from having spent now a few years doing this work that this story is just way too big to leave behind, way too important to move on from. Um, and even if it's a sort of an uncomfortable fit for me, as someone who does not come from an activist background, does not come from an environmentalist background, um, I think that this is too big a challenge for us to let our own temperament get in the way of engagement. I think if only those of us who are temperamentally suited to political activism on climate become activists, we're not gonna have nearly the political quorum that we need to produce the kind of change that we need. Um, I think we need a movement that really embraces all types of people with all types of inclinations, all types of backgrounds, all types of perspectives. And um, that's why I'm, you know, I'm trying to sort of lean into it um, and take the role that I found myself in. Um, but you know, it's, not, it's not entirely natural to me. Um, I mentioned earlier, I, I lived my whole life in New York City. I don't like think of the natural world as being my home. I think of the concrete city as being my home. I think of modern life, I think of you know, the neoliberal and like post Cold War America as the place that I grew up, which had very simple answers to a lot of these very complicated questions. And even if I knew at the time as a teenager that those answers were simplistic, they still formed the sort of environment in which I was raised. And um, it's still a little strange for me to, um, I mean I think it's strange for all of us coming to terms with how totally the world has changed and fallen apart over the last decade. Um, but I think climate is, an, is a sort of a, places a special demand on us because um, we must rethink very fundamentally every assumption that we were raised to believe in um, as members of at least my generation um, if we have a hope of getting a handle on this. We simply can't continue as we've been behaving as a nation, as a hemisphere, as, you know, as a civilization, um, all of those paths lead towards something like suicide. Um, I'm not somebody, you know, there are people on the environmental left who think that um, climate change is gonna mark the end of human civilization or that bring, bring about true human extinction. I don't think that that's likely on any time scale that it makes sense for us to think about but we're already imposing such enormous amounts of suffering on people all around the world, um, many of whom we choose to ignore, their suffering we choose to ignore, 
Um, but we're beginning to see over the last few years suffering much closer to home. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one reason why there has been a great awakening on this over the last year. It's a kind of an indictment of our, moral, of our moral imaginations that it takes us seeing the Kardashians fleeing from a forest fire, from a wildfire, to really wake up to the climate crisis when people in South Asia and the Middle East um, have been, Sub-Saharan Africa have been suffering from climate change for decades now. Um, but there we are. <laughs> and on some level, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm glad that the West is waking up to this crisis now, even though we'd probably all be better off if we had started taking action three decades ago when scientists first started raising alarm. You talk in the book and in the article about how a large proportion of climate change storytelling and communications was focused on sea level rise. This kind of like plotting event many decades into the future that you argue allowed or bred a kind of complacency. Um, that just changed yesterday. There was a brand new uh, model that came out. Do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, about sea level rise and what we know now that we didn't know 48 hours ago? Well, like everything else, when it comes to climate, the news just gets worse. Um, what's interesting about this particular um, new model is that it's not even a, um, a new estimate for how much sea level rise is likely to happen. It's actually a revised estimate of how low many of the lands um, in vulnerable parts of the world are. So even without revising upward our estimate for how much sea level rise we're likely to see by 2050, which is the time period that the study looked at, um, nevertheless, the authors concluded that three times as many people um, a total of about 300 million are likely to be at risk from um, basically permanent inundation, again, as soon as 2050. So the problem was that the satellites were reading the tops of buildings and tops of trees and, and averaging that out as the, as the land elevation in these densely populated river deltas and coastal cities. Yeah, and so, you know, the, um, you know, Mumbai, um, Basra, um, you know, there are whole other parts of the world, much of Vietnam, um, likely to be much more inundated than we had expected. And the truly terrifying thing about this is that the natural time scale to think about sea level rise is really tens of thousands of years. It takes that long for Arctic ice to truly melt. Um, certainly thousands of years, probably tens of thousands of years. Um, the fact that we're, see we're seeing in the models already such dramatic sea level rise just 30 years from now, yeah. that's not the end point of melt. That's the very, very, very fractional beginning of the likely sea level rise that we're going to see. Um, you know, it's estimated that just north of two degrees, which is likely where we'll be somewhere between 2040 and 2050 by even conservative estimates, we will lock in the permanent loss of all the planet's ice sheets, at which point, inevitably, we will have 250 or 260 feet of sea level rise, 80 meters of sea level rise, maybe 85 meters of sea level rise, which is enough to drown two-thirds of the world's major cities, maybe 80% of the world's major cities. Mm -hmm. Now, that is going to take place, like I said, over centuries, which means we will have time to adapt. But how many of those cities will we really be able to move? I mean, moving a city is a really complicated endeavor. Um, although in Indonesia, they're, doing, they're gonna be doing that by moving the capital away from Jakarta, yeah. in part because of sea level rise, in part because the city is just sinking. Um, and that's, you know, that's I think, um, one clear case study about the limitations of adaptation. We often think, I often think, okay, these things are really bad, but we will find some ways to live amidst their impacts with their suffering, adjust how we live. And that is undeniably true, that will happen. But the moving of 80% of the world's major cities is not a minor undertaking. Um, and that is one of the impacts that we have the most time to adjust to. Some of these others are, practically speaking, immediate. Um, you know, many of the biggest cities in South Asia and the Middle East are expected to be so hot in summer, again, just by 2050, that you won't be able to walk around outside on a lot of days in the summer without risking heat stroke and death. These are cities that today hold 10 or 12 or 15 million people. And as soon as 2050, you won't be able to really live in them, which is one reason why, again, just by 2050, the UN thinks that um, we could have at least 200 million 
and maybe one billion climate refugees. One billion is the number of people that live today in North and South America combined. I think those numbers are high, but you, know, you, you take the lower number, you divide it in half, you get a number of refugees 100 times the size of the Syrian refugee crisis that totally changed European politics. And that's another thing that I worry about an enormous amount is not just the direct climate impacts. Mm -hmm. It's the way that these things, you, um, Jorge hinted at this in, in his introduction, you hinted at this in, in, your, um, in your remarks earlier, um, the way that these changes do transform every aspect of the way that we live together and make it harder to sustain the sort of humane commitments that we want to make to one another, or at least I want us to make to one another, and make it much easier for us to turn, um, turn our backs on those who are most in need. Mm -hmm. If we imagine, if we take a look at what's happened in Europe because of one million Syrian refugees, or in the US because of climate-driven um, migration from um, Central America, um, and then you multiply those impacts a hundredfold, um, it's a recipe for some really dark politics, yeah. totally independent of the direct climate impacts. Um, we're probably gonna be even in a, in a relatively rosy climate scenario, we're probably going to be um, punishing each other as much as the climate is punishing well, us directly. It's already happening. Totally. Right? So let, let's come back to that in a minute. I mean, the, the time horizon that we're talking about, 2050, you said you're 37, so I'm 33. Uh, we will both be younger than many of the people in this room are today when these uh, things come to pass. And I think that one of the things that's most arresting about this book is the way that it brings that time horizon so much closer uh, to our present day. Sticking with the oceans uh, for a minute, you describe many very uh, colorful ways to die in this book. <laughs> uh, one of the most um, kind of total is uh, the hydrogen sulfide scenario. Can you, can you tell us about hydrogen sulfide? It's a toxic chemical. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's why you like, can smell flatulence is because your nose has been trained by evolution to like, really, really know what this smells like so you can get away from it. That's how bad it is. And it is the end result of um, processes that are already actually underway in lots of parts of the world's oceans, um, which are becoming less oxygenated um, and less supportive of um, ocean life. Um, now, we're in most parts of the ocean pretty early on in that story, um, but already in parts of the world there are large areas of what are called dead zones. Um, there's been one recurring in the Gulf of Mexico, there have been um, others in the Black Sea and elsewhere around the world in which, um, in part because of carbon uptake, um, which happens when water absorbs the carbon that we've put into the atmosphere. And just as a quick aside, I heard the other day that if, um, if the land had absorbed all of the carbon, or if, if, the, if the land had absorbed all the heat that the ocean had taken up, that um, we currently have 93 degrees Fahrenheit of global warming. Um, so <laughs> the ocean is, our, is, like, is absorbing the lion's share yeah. of the damage that we're doing to the planet. Yeah. One of those results is that the ocean is becoming more acidic, less oxygenated, and over time, um, in particular areas, at the moment, it's often um, also in, in, in part due to um, pollution, um, the runoff of, of fertilizer chemicals, which um, kind of accelerate this, can produce areas that are basically toxic to marine life and allow no, um, no new life to form and no existing life to thrive. And that is concerning in, in many, many ways. Um, these are some parts of the ocean that have sustained local communities' um, food supplies for centuries. Um, but it's also the case that the ocean supplies a huge chunk of the world's oxygen. Um, and if we can't produce the phytoplankton, they're called, the really small um, creatures that um, produce that, um, then we're going to be in some really big trouble. Now, um, you know, most people who study the oceans don't think that climate change is um, anywhere near a kind of global tipping point for oxygen creation. They don't think that we're... Um, you know, on any time horizon that it makes sense to think about, um, at risk of, um, of suffocating. But at a much more local level, um, we are already seeing 
ecosystems, marine ecosystems all around the world collapsing as a result of this um, process. And that's really true, not just in the oceans, it's true of almost every ecosystem you can look at around the world. We may not yet be at the point where humans are walking around, you know, dropping dead um, left and right because of climate change, but many other species on the planet are, yeah. and we are dependent on all of those species. So the, the more die-off that we see, um, the more vulnerable we will be our, ourselves. This is one of the, for me personally, great revelations that I've had in thinking about this stuff, and it sounds so naive, but I really did used to think that humans in the 21st century lived outside of nature. And the more I know about climate change, it's very clear. We are entirely dependent on the system. It encloses us, it provides the air we breathe, it provides the food we, I mean, this sounds so kindergarten level, but um, I do think that the way that most of us live our lives is on the presumption that we are protected from um, a mass extinction, mm -hmm. um, the mass extinction that we're living through, and we're not. <laughs> Well, if you're ever on the West Coast, I'm happy to take you uh, fishing while, yeah. while we still have time. Um, so in the, in the face of this information, there's, there's a few different responses, and you talk to a few different folks in the book. Uh, one of the most colorful is uh, this guy, Guy McPherson, who lives uh, on a farm in Belize. But there's a, there's a number of uh, people who take this information in and accept it, and uh, they take it in some really weird directions. What did you, what did you come across, or what surprised you as you as you talk to folks who basically accepted the inevitability of, of uh, climate annihilation? Well, I thought about those people as basically representing our collective future response. And I think that's really important in the sense that um, advocates and even storytellers often imagine that history will evolve along a single trajectory. Um, they, they, it's the temptation to do that on any particular issue is especially acute. So we think either we're gonna beat climate change or it's gonna defeat us. Um, we think this way about a lot of things, healthcare, educate, like either we're gonna go in one direction or we're gonna go in the other direction. On a planet as diverse and complicated as this one, full of people who are as diverse and complicated as people are, um, the much more common response is for many different people to have many different kinds of um, uh, responses to any particular crisis. And at the moment, I think it's still the case that most of the world um, is not really living as though the climate crisis is real and present. But once they do, it's not like a light switch is gonna go off and we're all gonna move in one direction. Mm -hmm. We're probably going to move in many, many different directions at once. And there almost certainly will be people who adapt a kind of, um, humane, humanitarian, um, almost philanthropic um, posture and want to do everything we can to alleviate the suffering of those who are suffering most. But there will also be those who are most focused on their own lives and protecting their loved ones. Um, I, a lot of question I get a lot, um, like when I'm signing books or something, is uh, where should I move? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you know it's funny because it, on some level it's an it's a logical response to an understanding that the world is in crisis. On the other hand, it's not a very it's not a morally um, honorable response. Um, and yet I to I understand it too. Um, and you know we're seeing um, already we're seeing a politics globally retreating from international commitments, retreating from. Um, the liberal global order, retreating from cooperative frameworks and institutions, and more and more countries of the world embracing a narrowly nationalistic view of their own self-interest. And I'm not sure that it's fair to say that like Donald Trump or Jair Bolsonaro are products of climate change, but I do think that if the world continues to warm, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if we saw more people like them who responded to a growing intuition of resource scarcity and more a sense of zero-sum competition with um, an understanding of political leadership that really primarily emphasized the role of securing the well-being of those people who lived within a particular leader's borders, even if that meant really aggressively um, you know, building walls, turning our back on, on people living elsewhere. 
Um, that's happening at the national level. Um, I think it's happening at the sort of international level where three years into the signing of the Paris Accords, no major industrial nation in the world is on track to meet its commitments. Only Morocco and Gambia are even compatible with the Paris goals. And you see examples left and right of even those um, international leaders who are understood to be um, climate conscious, um, nevertheless behaving often in ways that um, reflect a much more cold calculation of national self-interest. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Justin Trudeau has given a lot of lip service to climate concerns, has approved new oil pipelines. Um, you know, we saw Emmanuel Macron attacking Jair Bolsonaro over the fires in the Amazon um, a couple months ago. Macron, you know, famously failed to pass gas tax last year mm -hmm. um, and um, is doing a bit of grandstanding, I think, in part to um, play out non-climate issues in a climate, in the theater of climate politics. I think we're likely to see that unfold a lot more in the next decade where um, climate becomes a central feature of international competition and great power rivalry um, without necessarily moving us closer to actual solutions um, and collective action, which is, I think, really what we need. Um, and on the individual level, you know, there are people like you and me who are quite aware of this threat, but still flying. Um, more importantly, I think, because I think that individual action like air travel and, and um, diet are relatively insignificant contributors. More importantly, there are a lot of people like you and me who are really scared about climate change and yet haven't totally reoriented our politics around climate, which is to say, um, you know, I'm watching the American Democratic primary unfold and I see one candidate in the, in the primary who's all in on climate, Jay Inslee, um, and I'm, I'm thankful that he was in that race. I spoke to him a couple of times, did a, actually a couple of events with him and stuff, but um, I probably wasn't gonna vote for him. Mm -hmm. um, because I myself hadn't yet totally reoriented my politics around this issue, even though it's what I say all the time when people ask me, what should I do? I say, you should reorient your politics around this issue. That's how important it is. Um, and then there are people who are much, at the individual level, taking much uglier lessons from it and deciding that no collective action or um, cooperative engagement is worth it yeah. because the world's burning anyway. Um, and people who are so nihilistic and see the only positive outcome as a, as, um, a sort of eco-fascist future that they um, you know, arm themselves and commit massacres to try and inspire a sort of right-wing uprising in the name of climate crisis. And we saw that in, in Christchurch in New Zealand. We saw that in Texas a few months ago um, in the US. Now, both of those shooters, I think, are their climate politics, I don't think explain the full scope of their action. But I, again, if I'm not gonna be surprised to see more Donald Trumps and Gerald Bolsonaro's on the world stage, I'm also not gonna be surprised to see more um, climate terrorists of the right. I'm also probably not gonna be surprised to see climate terrorists on the left because ultimately, as much as it pains me to say, as someone who is a kind of establishmentarian liberal at heart, I know that the crisis we're facing is bigger and more urgent than our present tense politics can accommodate. And that means that in order to address it, we need to change our politics. Now, I don't wanna change it in the direction of you know, the Christchurch shooter, obviously. Um, I also don't wanna see a flourishing of left-wing environmental terrorism. I wanna see a reorientation of our existing politics um, animated by liberal values addressing this crisis. But um, as I say, not everybody's gonna to respond to this issue in the same way. Um, we're not gonna have the same political impulses. We're not gonna have the same personal concerns. We're not gonna have the same storytelling impulses. We're not gonna to respond to the same kinds of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, it's way too big and complicated and overwhelming a saga to expect that the world will um, respond in any one way or move in, in only one direction. We're gonna to get to questions from the audience in, in a minute, but I guess to close, I would ask, since you, since you wrote the book, since you submitted the manuscript, 
are there, are there developments, are there things that have happened that have um, given you some, some glimmer of hope? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's um, something I've thought a lot about because I turned this book in, we sort of rushed it to press, so I turned it in last September. Um, and at that point, I had, you know, concluded the book with a sort of halfway upbeat note which said basically the scale of the, of the crisis that we're facing, the incredible terror that is possible is also a reflection of our power over the climate, that these scenarios are only gonna come to pass if we make them come to pass. Our hands are on those levers. We can drive that story how we want it. And that we have a path forward through politics to take action. In fact, that's what politics is for, whatever our sort of, however neoliberal culture taught us to think that we make our mark on the world politically through what we buy and what we consume. Really what politics is for is for us to build a system of collective priority that will allow us to address a crisis like this. I finished the book on that sort of half hopeful note, which I sort of half believed. I mean, I knew it was true, logically true, but I also looked back on the past generation of climate activism, scientific warnings, protests, and saw basically no progress. Um, Until the IPCC authors read your book. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, it's, it's really, it's really eye-opening when you think about, you know, we've known about the greenhouse effect for a century and a half, a little bit more. We've really known about what that would mean for at least 30 years since the mid-80s. More emissions have been produced in the last 30 years than in the entire history of humanity that came before. So that's since Al Gore published his first book on warming, it's since the UN established its IPCC um, climate change body, um, which signaling to the world unmistakably that this was a huge crisis, which means that we've done more damage knowingly than we ever managed in ignorance. Um, and that is really scary when we think about what's where we're headed, that knowledge is not itself sufficient. Mm -hmm. And I think the layperson believes that as the world is waking up, we're probably moving too slowly, but moving in the right direction. In fact, last year we set a new global record for emissions. We're probably gonna set a new record this year among other reasons, because more people are using air conditioning to deal with extreme heat, which right. we've ushered into, um, into being because of, of climate change. Um, so I looked back on the past 30 years and I said, people have been raising the alarm for 30 years and we've only moved in the wrong direction. And so I didn't have that much hope in political progress. But a year later, things look really, really different. I mean, last September, yeah, we hadn't seen that UN report, which has been, I think, a total game changer. Um, we had never heard of Greta Thunberg. Nobody outside of Sweden had. Extinction Rebellion had not formed in the UK. Now they've forced a conservative parliament to declare a climate emergency and committed to going zero carbon by 2050, which is, for me, way too slow, but still way more <laughs> ambitious than anything that had been floated by a country like that before. And in the aftermath of that, of that commitment, in the aftermath of that commitment, Norway and Finland and Denmark all made even more ambitious commitments. A year ago, Sunrise had not announced itself in the US. We had not even elected AOC to Congress, let alone been debating the Green New Deal in any serious way. And we've now been walking through a democratic primary in which every candidate is trying to compete with the next one to be more ambitious on this issue. Now, a lot of this transformation is at the moment just at the level of pledges. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be cautious in assessing those because basically when it comes to climate, no pledge has ever been fulfilled. But the fact that the pledges are so much more ambitious I think is really meaningful. And when you combine it with the incredible protest action that we've seen out on the streets and the movement in public opinion polls, which you know in the US, that's the example I know best, but you know, 10% more people now are concerned about climate change than we're concerned about it just a year ago. That's incredible progress by any political science metric. I think that we now have an opportunity to do much more than seemed responsible to consider even a year ago. Um, and even more than what seems possible, I think this new political progress is exciting in that it opens up a whole new category of things that are probably gonna be really, really hard to achieve, 
but a year ago would have seemed totally impossible. And if we keep moving and keep applying political pressure and keep growing concern, those things will move more and more into the realm of mainstream possibility over time, which is frankly what we need because even the incredibly rapid political movement that we've seen over the last year is woefully inadequate given the scale of the challenge that we face. The UN says to avoid catastrophic warming, we need to cut our emissions in half globally by 2030, basically. And they say that in order to achieve that, we would need a global World War II scale mobilization beginning this year, 2019. Now, World War II, every man of fighting age was drafted into the army. Every woman of working age was drafted into the workforce. Factories were nationalized. Whole industries were nationalized and repurposed in the time scale of six months or a year. That is what the UN says is necessary to avert a level of warming that scientists call catastrophic and island nations of the world call genocide. So we need a lot more than Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion and AOC and the Green New Deal to have a hope of securing a future that everyone in this room would consider relatively comfortable. Thankfully, we still have a chance at that, mm -hmm. but it will require a completely profound reorientation of our politics and probably our culture and our economy as well. Now, I think that we can do that and still secure some of the expectations of prosperity and growth that we've been raised um, on, but there will be some meaningful adjustments that have to take place as well. And at the moment, I think the most important thing is for us to all just understand um, the world is going to be transformed dramatically, whatever we do. So the choice before us is, do we want to do what we can to secure changes that bring us towards a healthier, more stable, more just, more equitable, more prosperous future? Or do we want to sort of sit idly by as the changes come without our consent <laughs> and make it impossible to dream of a future with economic growth, with the whole planet inhabited, um, you know, defined by, say, a doubling of war, a halving of agricultural yields, a refugee crisis at a scale that we can't possibly comprehend today. We have to make changes one way or the other. The question is, do we want to make changes that will comport with our values or that will just buckle us and turn us into um, the worst examples of ourselves today. Um, and I think that's why climate change is, you know, it's really hard to project where we're headed. Science can tell us a lot about what will happen if we don't do anything, but ultimately, it's a human question. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna respond? Are we gonna rapidly decarbonize? Are we gonna deploy huge amounts of negative emissions? Are we going to um, build in social justice values to our response so that the people, the poorest people in the world, um, the people suffering most in the global south um, are prioritized? Or are we going to turn away and um, pretend as though this crisis isn't already upon us? And honestly, I don't know the answer to that question, which is probably the scariest part.